in unconditional eternal security has been around for a long time. As far as I know, the first discussion of it was in the Garden of Eden. God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. And if they did, they would surely die. The serpent countered by saying to Eve, you surely shall not die. As an agent of Satan, the serpent gave Adam and Eve a false sense of security, making them willing to sin. The question that I'm dealing with is, can Christians willfully return to the practice of sin from which the grace of Christ has delivered them and still be saved? This book that I'm holding in my hand says, no, no, you cannot return to a willful, knowing, deliberate choice of sinning lifestyle and still be saved. Many people express their belief in eternal security by the use of slogans. You all have heard them, once saved, always saved, once in grace, always in grace, once a son, always a son. The more technical theological term is perseverance of the saints. These terms raise theological questions, but they also relate directly to the practice of ministry, such as evangelism, discipleship, caring for grieving families. A church member may ask about the salvation of a person that has died in a questionable spiritual condition. Or a teenager may ask if her friend who committed suicide will go to heaven. These kinds of questions remind us of the relevance of the study of believer security in light of the Bible. It is relevant to our lives and our assurance of salvation and even to our ministries. In looking at scripture, backsliding and apostasy in the Old Testament provide the background of the New Testament teaching about falling away from God and returning to the old life of sin. God's choosing Israel and delivering them from the bondage of Egypt were no guarantee of eternal security. God's delivering grace did not uh, relieve them of their individual responsibility. The Old Testament knows no such doctrine as once in grace, always in grace. There is no security outside of doing the will of God. The same is true in the New Testament. At the beginning of our life in Christ, we experience what is known as the new birth. The New Testament does not teach that the new birth cannot be undone. The opposite of this birth is not unbirth, it is death. Spiritual death is not impossible for the believer. In Romans 8, Paul wrote to the Christians in the city of Rome that if they live according to the flesh, they would die. Jesus assured believers of divine protection and care. But does such assurance mean once saved, always saved? Supporters of unconditional eternal security often appeal to John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. 
and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them from my hand. These verses seem to teach eternal security in salvation. But before assuming a blanket guarantee that a believer cannot fall away, we need to give the verses uh, their full value. A number of the verbs in the passage, John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, are in the present tense, implying continuous, ongoing action and can be translated, my sheep keep on hearing my voice, and I keep on knowing them, and they keep on following me, and I keep on giving them eternal life. Those who continue to hear the good shepherd's voice and continue following him are the ones that will never perish or be snatched out of God's hands. The intent of John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, is to teach faithful believers not to worry about those who persecute them and the danger of death. This passage does not deny the possibility of a believer falling away and losing the gift of eternal life. Many of Jesus' warnings to his disciples clearly indicate the grave danger of Christians falling away. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 through 37, and Mark chapter 3, verses 23 through 30, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. However, in Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12, Jesus warned his own disciples of the same danger, that is, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. After admonishing the disciples to remain faithful during these times of hardship and persecution, Jesus went on to say, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. The disciples were to be faithful in critical times and guard against insulting the Holy Spirit. Jesus' purpose was not to make believers feel insecure, but to let them know the trials and the temptations were inevitable and that they must guard themselves from being spiritually overconfident. The disciples themselves could blaspheme the Holy Spirit and fall away. We find terms such as predestination and elect in the Bible, but these terms indicate that God took the initiative to provide salvation for all people. And God decided to do this before he created the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Through Christ, God has redeemed a number of people and has appointed them to particular tasks. Among them was the Apostle Paul, who says that he was separated from his mother's womb unto the gospel. Even then, he gave the impression that his response of obedience was his own choice, and he did not deny having led others to salvation that he himself could fall away. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 22 through 27, Paul recognized that unbelief and persistent sinning are grave dangers to personal salvation. Sin, regardless of the form it takes, displeases God. No Christian 
should take any sin lightly. But there are, there is a popular interpretation of Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, that says that no power can separate us from the saving love of God. The Apostle Paul enumerated a number of powers, but he says nothing that eliminates unbelief and sin as dangers to believers' salvation. All who hear the gospel have the freedom to make a decision for Christ. But that is the beginning of salvation. We must persevere by living a holy life. Without holiness, no one shall see God. The Bible teaches that salvation is a process from conversion to glorification, but eternal security makes glorification inevitable no matter the quality of the believer's character. Paul, however, insists that continuing to sin makes final salvation impossible. He raises the rhetorical question, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? To indicate the absurdity of such a practice, he asserts, by no means, we died to sin, how can we live in sin any longer? Eternal security has a strong appeal because the doctrine is so comforting. The assurance that nothing, including sinning and unbelief, can separate us from God appeals to the postmodern generation. A one-sided emphasis on grace tends to ignore the call to holiness and the necessity of godly living for eternal life. Just as grace cost God the Father the life of His Son, it also cost us ungodly pleasures and demands that we strive not to sin and to seek holiness in every matter of living. Today, some churches have a number of members who are habitual backsliders. For these members, Sundays and revivals are times of repentance and returning to the Lord. But Monday through Saturday and between revivals are times for backsliding. Those who repeatedly get in and out of salvation like a biblical understanding of spiritual security. There is more security in Christ than an habitual backslider understands. Salvation is not turned off like you turn off a faucet of water or like you turn off the lights in your house by switching, by flipping a switch. The intent here is not to minimize the importance of the altar service. The altar service is always important and it is always an appropriate place for pastors to encourage us to rededicate our lives. Pastors and their staffs face many challenges today. Congregations include veterans who have decades of experience in the Christian life and those who may be beginners in the faith. Many local churches have large numbers of members from different churches, different denominations and traditions with different beliefs in some areas of doctrine and different practices in regard to lifestyles. As their shepherds, pastors must help them to avoid sinning and sinking into indifference and unbelief and to live holy lives that glorify God. 
Let me just conclude here by assuring you that God's word promises persevering grace to all faithful believers. And I underscore that word faithful to all unfaithful faithful believers. When Christ returns for his people, God will present us holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And the scripture clearly says, if indeed we continue in faith firmly, establish and steadfast, uh, indeed continue in faith firmly, established and steadfast and not move away from the gospel, God will assure us of eternal salvation. So in conclusion, keep your hand in the hands of the Savior. Live a holy life and you will go to heaven and see God face to face. Your salvation is nearer today than it was. Hold on to God, and I assure you that he will hold on to you. God bless you.